Before you get deeply involved in editing your tape, we would like to preach to you just a bit so that you don't get confused and give up in disgust. What we assume is the reason that you're watching this tape is that you're going to have to do some editing yourself to finish up your own video project. So before we get down to the stuff that we really want you to remember, perhaps the place to start is by trying to explain just what videotape editing is. First of all, a lot of people seem to think that videotape editing is a process a lot like film splicing, you know, where you cut and glue your best shots together. Basically, however, that's not really quite the way we do it. In a sense, videotape editing is more like making Xerox copies of something you typed. Instead of cutting your original tape, what you have to do is make a copy of your tape. One shot at a time. Eliminating those parts of what you originally shot that you really didn't want and keeping those parts that you do. Allowing you to create on a second reel of tape a smooth, continuous sequence of pictures and sounds. Now, I don't really think you should get too carried away with this example. In reality, tape editing is both like Xeroxing paper and like cutting film. Since editing is a system of copying, the pictures and sounds in your final edited tape aren't really going to be quite as good as they were when you recorded them. And therefore, you should realize that the degree to which they lose quality depends in part on decisions that you make and things that you do. For example, the condition of the machines that you use affects your completed program. The way you adjust those machines affects your program. The condition of the reels of tape that you use, new or old, makes a difference. Where you store your tapes, whether you smoke near your tapes, and several other seemingly insignificant things can affect the success of your project. So if you want to keep your audience from getting up and leaving, right, it's very important that you understand how to operate these machines. The transitions that happen in your program are what we call edits. A proper, well-done edit is just a simple cut from one shot to another, one that doesn't cause the viewer to see anything other than a simple cut. Any edit that causes the picture to roll or have any other unwanted video disturbance is a bad edit. Any edit that causes the viewer to hear any strange noises, such as extra breaths or parts of words, is a bad edit. And since it's almost impossible to fix these edits after you've finished your editing, you really should be able to spot a bad edit so that you can fix it while you're editing when it's still easy. Now, it is important that you go back and check each shot just after you copy it. And if it's wrong, that's the time to fix it. Most editing systems have at least two videotape machines one that we usually call the player and one that we call the recorder. Now, the player is the one that plays back the tape that has on it the original shots that you recorded, and the recorder is the machine that will record in sequence each of the shots that you select onto a second reel of tape. Like the Xerox copier that we talked about earlier, the quality of this second reel of tape that the recorder makes, what we call the assemble master, depends on your ability to adjust both of these machines, especially the player. To do that, you have to make two adjustments to this machine. The first is called tracking. The tracking knob should be adjusted so that any unwanted video disturbances, such as these, aren't there. Now, most of the time, these occurrences happen down around the bottom of the picture, but occasionally they roll up through the picture like this. Careful, slow adjustment of the tracking knob should cause them to disappear. Some players have a tracking meter next, somewhere near the knob. If you use it, the needle should be set not necessarily at any particular position, but as high as it'll go. You should realize, however, that the final test isn't how it looks on the meter, but how the picture looks on the screen. If it's wrong there, it's wrong, and the tracking knob should be readjusted. The other player adjustment that has to be made is called skew. The skew adjustment's one that's best made with a cross-pulse monitor, which is a monitor that lets you look at the area in between the pictures. 
or with an underscan monitor, which is just a monitor that lets you look at the edges of the pictures. In either case, the skew adjustment should be made so that all of the vertical lines throughout the picture are as straight up and down as you can make them. Both of these adjustments to the player need to be watched throughout your editing process. Now, of the two, tracking is probably the most critical, and it's the one that should get most of your attention. If either of them drift, they can ruin your project. So as you're editing your tape, throughout the whole process, keep an eye on them. Sometimes it's hard because you get distracted. But watch them, and if they need it, adjust them. Now, the recorder also has a skew and a tracking knob but they're a little bit easier to set. Most recorders set the skew by themselves, so you don't have to do anything. The tracking knob on most recorders has an index position called fix. Assembled master tapes should be done with that knob set to this position. So put it to the fixed position and make sure it stays there through your whole editing project. At the same time, you should realize that each individual recorder is just a little bit different than every other recorder. So you should do your project on one recorder. If you change the recorder in the middle of your project, you may have problems with your program. There are two different editing modes on your recorder that you will have to choose between. One of them is called Assemble, and the other one is called Insert. Now, the essential difference between the two modes lies in how much the recorder records. The recorder generally records a minimum of three tracks. Down the center of the tape, in a series of diagonal bands, the recorder places the picture track. Along one edge of the tape, in a continuous band, the recorder places the sound track. Along the other edge of the tape, in a series of pulses, the recorder places what we call the control track. Now, the control track does on tape what sprocket holes do on film. In order for a videotape machine to be able to play back a tape correctly, it must have these control track pulses throughout the tape. In the assemble mode, all three of these tracks, the picture, the sound, and the control track, always go into record. In the insert mode, either the picture or the sound or both of them go into record, but the control track never goes into record. So if any part of your tape gets made in the insert mode, where there is no control track, that part of the tape won't play back at all. Now, why do you ask if the tape won't play back without the control track pulse? Is there this thing called the insert mode at all? And the answer to that is very simple if you always remember that the insert mode, like the word insert implies, is only used to insert something into some other shot that was already recorded in the assemble mode and already has the control track pulses through that area of the tape. Let me say that again. The insert mode should only be used to replace something that was already recorded in the assemble mode and already has the control track pulses. There are really only two times when you should consider using the insert mode. One of them is when you want to change something in the picture track and you don't want to change the audio track. And the other one is the reverse of that, when you want to change something in the audio track, and you don't want to change something in the picture track. Hence, there are two insert modes, one of them called video only, when you want to change the picture, and one of them called audio only, when you just want to change the sound. Another good reason to use the insert mode is that insert edits can go in and out. That is, they can start in the middle of a previously assembled recorded shot, and they can end before that shot is finished. Assemble mode shots can't do that. All the assemble mode can do is go into record in such a way that it overlaps a previously recorded shot, but it can never end cleanly. That is, you can't ever get a good edit to something that was already recorded on the tape. Therefore, you must be very careful throughout your editing to be in the correct mode, either in assemble or in insert. Failure to be in the right mode is probably the most common mistake that people make, and it's also the most fatal mistake that people make. The video and audio level knobs, which adjust how much picture and sound get recorded on your tape, do have to be set. Setting them too low will get you flat pictures and unintelligible sound. Setting them too high will get you distortion. And setting them drastically differently between your shots will cause annoying shifts that are noticeable between the pictures and sound. Generally, we prefer to operate the video level in the automatic mode. 
The audio knob gives you some choices. If the audio knob on your machine is labeled limiter, you might consider using it because it will help you reduce some of the unwanted peaks in your tape. But if that knob is labeled AGC, you probably shouldn't use it because it will amplify all of the noise between words and sentences, and that can get awfully annoying. We prefer carefully adjusting the sound levels manually from shot to shot. There is a very important point that should be made, and it's a point that's really very critical at the time you're shooting your original shots. When you get to the step-by-step -step part of editing, you're going to find out that both the player and the recorder have to be playing back video immediately ahead of each shot that you're going to copy. In order for the edit to occur properly, there must be a roll-up period that's part of each of your original shots. If you don't, when you're out in the field, let your recorder run continuously about five to ten seconds before each of your shots, your edits may not work very well. So make sure that your recorder is started at least ten seconds before anything important happens in front of your camera. One other point. It is imperative that you not use the video level knob on your recorder to fade your pictures to black or fade your pictures up out of black. Unless your particular editing system has a fader built into it that's separate from the recorder or the player, then cuts to black are all that's possible. Fades to black, I'm sorry to say, are never possible. We've now come to the point where we've said what we've got to say, and you've come to the point where you're going to actually have to learn the step-by-step -step process of editing on your system. Now, that's probably most easily done by using the manuals that come with your system and working until you get to a point where you're stuck, and then go out and call or somebody that already knows how to edit on that system and ask them for help. But please try and remember now what we've talked about in this tape, because all of it's very basic to editing. That should make reading those manuals a lot easier, it should make your editing easier, and it should help you avoid some of the common pitfalls as you go about finishing your video project. Good luck.